Hey everyone. We have a special guest today. We have our very old co-host of the 21 Minutes Less podcast, Keisha Milana. She Hi. is here to give us an interview based on how she is able to maintain her own mental health from a person who is in the professional. And as you all know, we advocate for going to therapy. We advocate for doing things to help with your mental health. But sometimes we all, sometimes we may feel like seeking that help is one sided. We don't get to hear from the expert about what they do and how they're able to like set boundaries when it comes to their clients, how they're able to take in all this information without it being detrimental to them as well. So this is our opportunity from outsiders getting the inside scoop on how mental health professionals are able to maintain their own mental health. And I'm pretty sure she's going to give us some really good tips and habits on how we can maintain our health as the person on the other side. Welcome, Keisha Milana. <laughs> Hi. It's so good to be on the other side. I um, know. Yes. How are it's you feeling today? Let's start there. So, first of all, I just <laughs> got back from California this morning. Okay. My flight was delayed. Um, so, that was like a whole annoyance. But other than that, I've been good. It's just dealing with a delayed flight and then the time change from mm -hmm. going to California and then coming back to Chicago. It's, it's a struggle today. <laughs> okay. But you made it. I did. And we thankful for you taking the time out to even do this interview where you just came back from traveling. And I yeah. know you stated previously that traveling is one of your favorite things to do. Yes. How do you recoup when you come back from traveling? Rest. I got to rest. Um like even this morning, <laughs> even this morning, the kid was so gracious to give me an extra hour or two to just rest. Um, I also like to make sure that I unpack as soon as possible because you know some of your things that you use on a daily basis are packed up when you go out of town. You know, it could be small stuff, flat irons, uh, your charger, other stuff, different clothes you want to wear or wash. And I feel like getting back to that sense of normalcy as soon as mm -hmm. I can, it really helps me to recover after traveling because I'm like out of my element, even if it's just for a few days. Um, other things, just like seeing my family, seeing my friends. I was so excited to see my son today. And he was so excited to see me just because once you go out of town, Especially since I do a lot of solo traveling, you mm -hmm. miss your people. You want to go back home and see them and like hang out, chill because you haven't been able to for a few days. Especially if you kind of busy when you out of town, you're not able to talk as much as you might normally talk to them. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes, I love that. And last week you spoke about being authentic to your audience and being vulnerable with them to be able to make that connection. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to ask you some questions. Mm -hmm. You do not have to answer them. If you don't feel comfortable answering them, but I wanted to ask you some questions so the audience can get a connection. If you don't want to just say, I'll pass on it. <laughs> okay, cool. I got okay. you. <laughs> All right. We're going to start off with something simple. What is your real name and why did you choose Keisha Milana? <laughs> I know the backstory to this, but our audience don't know. <laughs> Go oh, ahead. Yeah. I was not expecting that question. Okay, so okay, so when I was in high school, Kiera, which is my real name, was the most popular name in my class. Like, you know, it was five of us. Like, everybody 
kind of had their own moniker, like, oh, the smart Kiara or mm -hmm. this Kiara or the gay Kiara or that. So it just became a lot, honestly. <laughs> and me and my best friend was like, no, like you need an alias. You need something else because there's too many Kiaras. And mm -hmm. we just came up with Keisha. And I don't know if you like into rap or hip hop a lot, but they use the word, the name Keisha in a lot of songs. So I was like, mm -hmm. oh, like, I could feel like they're talking about me when my songs come on. Like, I like that name. And then Milana is just completely fictional. It just okay. sounds cute. It just sounds rich. It sounds important. It just flows off the tongue. And, yeah, I just started using that name since high school when me and my best friend was like, it's too many different Kiaras. And it just didn't feel individual no more. It's like people trying to give you a nickname, Kiki, all that. I never liked the nickname Kiki. So I was just like, no, like y'all could call me Keisha. And then when we went to college, me and my best friend actually went to the same college. So when we went away, it was kind of just like, okay, you just going to tell people your name, Keisha. Like, this your name. You like it better. Um... So, like, why not just be getting called this? So, when I was in college, people really thought that was my name, like, my real name. Okay. Because that's what I would always tell them. So, it just stuck from college and from high school. But it really, it started out of, like, a lack of individuality with the name mm -hmm. Kiara. Yes. That's so interesting you say that. Because I just did a devotional. Mm -hmm. And... The devotional is about different hues, different colors, mm -hmm. and that we do not live in a monocratic world. We have to appreciate diversity and the fact that she was like, okay, let me make myself stand out from everybody else. So there is no confusion. Let me come up with yes. names. And exactly. like you said, you mentioned rappers. Rappers come up with their names. Authors come up with pen names. Coming up with different names to express yourself, that's beautiful, especially mm -hmm. when you're trying to, you know, make your own identity. A hundred percent. Yes, that was probably the best thing I could have did. <laughs> it was probably the best thing I could have did. And then I feel like it also just create a separation from like mm -hmm. people who really know you and people who don't really know you. Because okay. like... Even in college, only people who really knew me knew, like, my real name was Kiara. But, you know, you in college, you know, you have so many acquaintances and people you casually know. It's like, you probably don't even want nobody to know your real name because you don't know what they're going to try to put you in or nothing. So, it's like a real alias at this point. And, like, the people who really know me know my real name. But if you don't know me, that let me know. That lets me know, like. It, it's some people I know in years, they mm -hmm. still think my name is Keisha. And oh, wow. I'm like, yeah, you don't really know me. Because if it never even came up somehow, some way, it's, you don't know me. Because <laughs> okay. when I do stuff for school, it's like my real name. Or like getting awards, scholarships, whatever, whatever. So like, you almost not paying attention if you don't realize it. Because I still post it. Like, I post it on social media. I post it a lot. But mm -hmm. it's just I would never tell nobody. Like, right? <laughs> you kind of got to figure it out, almost. So yeah. Okay. Okay. And for the people who don't know, I I mention it all the time. You are in your PhD program. I. Am. Where are some lessons you are learning as a school psychologist that helps you on your day to day life? Oh, that's a good question. Um, are you talking about in general, just from being in the program? Yeah. Like, or my like, school or anything? Yeah. So, like, so one lesson I have learned is that people can be very microaggressive. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm actually glad that I'm in the lab that I'm in. It's called Rams Lab, which is like research researchers against microaggressions in schools. So our whole lab, we only do research on microaggressions. So I'm really proud and happy that I learned about a microaggression because 
I started experiencing them at, at my school, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. And that has been one of the biggest things I've learned, just like how to deal with that in the real world and expressing myself and combating them and standing up and advocating for myself to make sure that, you know, if I can't advocate for myself, how I'm going to advocate for these kids when I have my future profession as a school site. So I'm just like, unfortunately, I've gotten a lot of practice dealing with it and learning how to ignore it and interacting with white people. That has Mm -hmm. been like one of the biggest like lessons, um, unfortunately. And in addition to that, the stuff that we learn in class is very invaluable. So I appreciate learning so much about the school system, like Mm -hmm. especially as a new parent. It's definitely an advantage to be able to understand how the schools work. How do they go through getting students interventions if they're not performing well? How do you advocate for your kids to get them an IEP? You know, what types of social emotional learning strategies do you need to improve the emotional intelligence of someone else? Um, Behavioralism and learning about how do you modify behavior, like, You know, I use it in certain school or clinical settings, but it's really good to know just in general how to change your own behaviors and understanding, you know, why other people may have certain behaviors and how they need to be changed. Like even just learning simple stuff like in school, we have what we call the four functions of behavior. So essentially every single behavior that people do, whether good or bad, it essentially comes back to like four different main things. So like one is attention. So people do stuff for attention. Go figure. Like, you know, we always maybe know that in the back of our heads, but to understand that that really is one of the four functions of behavior. Um, Also escape or to get out of something or to avoid something, which again, people might think like, oh yeah, such and such is acting this way. Because they're trying to get out of this or get out of that. But when you really understand that, like, yes, that's actually one of the four reasons that, you know, somebody would do anything, then it, you just start to see the world in a different lens. Um, another one is, like, for sensory um, reasons. So, like, if a baby keeps throwing a cup, maybe they like hearing the banging noise. Um mm-hmm. You know, or they like to feel it leaving their hands, things like that. So that was like one of the most important things that I learned, the four functions of behavior and understanding how to modify behavior, which, again, I feel like when you are in a mental health field, you just start to look at everything in the world differently. And Mm -hmm. Almost, it's like a good and a bad. Like, you know why people are doing things. Like, okay, somebody yelling at you and tripping. you like, okay, you want some attention. Or, okay, you're trying to get out of me calling you out about being wrong or whatever it may be. Or you just want to hear yourself yell. Um, so it's different things like that. Um, and I don't think I said the fourth one, but just so y'all know. Just the FYI, and y'all can look this up. But the fourth function of behavior is like tangible. So, like, people do things to get something. Like, am I yelling at you because I know you're going to eventually give in and give me Wendy's if if it's a baby and they're yelling on the way home? So, people do stuff for attention, avoidance, uh, sensory reasons, or tangible reasons. So, to get something. And once you learn like little tidbits like that, it's just life changing because now you know why everybody doing everything. And you're like, okay, why is this person doing this? Like, yes. why does this lady think she could cut me at the grocery store? Oh, <laughs> she's trying to avoid waiting in line. Too bad, girl. Um, I'm I'm not waiting in line either. So it just be little stuff like that. Um, on top of like I said, the social emotional learning, being able to understand how to modify behavior, being able to understand IEPs and accommodations and that whole process. Again, especially since I have a kid now, that's Mm -hmm. valuable stuff that most parents don't know. So I'm already feeling ahead of the game a lot more than somebody who hadn't gone through that training. Yes, that 
is valuable information, especially for people who want to get into the mental health profession. Yes. Having that background can not only help other people, but it can help you, as Keisha just stated. It's going to help her with her son. It helps her be able to maintain her composure when it comes to microaggressions. And then it helps her to identify in other people some of the tactics that they may be using um, in order to get what they want or get attention or, and things of that nature. So that was very valuable information. And the reason why you chose psychology as your major is the reason why I told I chose sociology as my minor. Sociology mm -hmm. is to study society as a whole. Mm -hmm. You're able to look at religion, um, business, crime, society, and things of that nature. And that's why I'm able to look at um, society from the lens that I look at it from because I have been able to study society, its cycles and like right now we in inflation that's a part of economics it's a cycle it, it goes through that cycle knowing that in the summertime crime increases because of the heat and things of that nature it's a cycle <laughs> so yeah. Education is very valuable. I don't care what anybody says. They can tell you it's not worth it, but taking out the student loans, it may not be worth it for the years. But once you know something, knowledge is power. Can't nobody take that away from you. And once you have that information, it's less likely that you can be deceived. It's less likely that um, you can um, be told just anything, especially when you know the truth and things of that nature. So just if you're looking into going to school for anything, just know that the information is going to be valuable. Make sure you study. Make sure you put your best foot forward and be passionate about what it is that you're learning. Because not only is it going to help others, but it's going to help you in the long run as well. All right. Um, and just a, a quick follow up on that. Yes, definitely mm -hmm. what you said. Be passionate about it and do do things that you don't even need to necessarily study like you just really mm -hmm. love it that much or you do outside research on it on your own. Like, what are the things you type in, in Google? What are the things you're curious about? What conversations are you having with your friends? Mm -hmm. That can kind of lead you also to learning about what are you passionate about? What do you want to do? Because for me, I knew that I wanted to be in a mental health field or study psychology because mm -hmm. in high school, I used to go to sleep in class a lot. And mm -hmm. that was like, I took an AP psych class my senior year. And that was one of the the only classes that I did not go to sleep in. So for me, that meant like, okay, maybe I should major in this when I go to college. I'm actually interested. So look at those cues when you're in school to see what are you doing outside research on? Are you looking up presidents and wars and stuff? Okay, maybe you need to do something with history because that interests you. Like, what are you watching on TV? What are you thinking about when you see TV? When I see even like them judge shows or baddies or whatever it could be, I'm mm -hmm. watching TV. I'm looking at like, okay, this girl have a mental health issue. She might have this. She might have that. It could be this going on with the family. You know, like I'm already mm -hmm. getting my wheels turning. So when you're picking out what you want to do for the rest of your life, Think about what comes naturally of interest to you. And that's why I pick psychology. I'm like, this is the only thing I'm standing up for. Okay, cool. I might like this. Absolutely. And don't just rely on Google either. Books. Mm -hmm. Get yeah. books. Things can change in the internet. Anybody can put any information out there. But books, they... They can change it, they can update it, edit it too. Not saying that it can't be edited, but books are a really good resource for you when you are seeking knowledge, not just the internet, because anybody can put anything on the internet. All That's right. <laughs> One thing I want to know for sure mm -hmm. is how do you maintain your own mental health 
when it comes to your profession. For people who don't know, being a therapist or being a psychologist or anything of that nature, it's a high suicide rate in that field. Mm. And it could be for many reasons. It could be trauma from other people just piling it onto you. It could be you may get triggered from somebody else's experience that you have already dealt with that could trigger you into, you know, having those thoughts. How can you place those boundaries between you and your clients to where you don't mentally decline yourself when it comes to talking to others and <clears throat> take on all that trauma? Yeah, I think that's a good point. And you just said something great that not even just, you know, suicide rates, but like having mental health conditions is very common for people who are mental health professionals because they might be overwhelmed or anxious, you know, about the things they hear it or, you know, feeling depressed or down when they hear so much different negative stuff. So first thing I would say, know your limits. So mm -hmm. for me, that meant not being a therapist, which some people, they can sit and do therapy for 40 hours a week. And that's cool. I applaud them. That's not for me. And I knew that I wanted to be in the mental health profession, but I didn't necessarily want to be a therapist. So after I got my master's and I got a chance to do my internship for a year and I became like a, a mental health professional, I didn't pursue my licensure. And because I was like, yeah, I can't see myself doing this for 40 hours a week. So sometimes it could be trial and error that helps you to understand what you really want to do. I'm like, OK, what else can I do? I start doing my research, doing my, um, you know, Googles to see like what mental health professional, what jobs can you have as a mental health professional that's not a therapist? So I was like, okay, I could see myself being a psychologist. We still have the ability to do therapy, but we also get to do assessments. We work with IEPs. We work with students. So it's fun to be able to do so much other stuff, but still have that ability if I want to, to do therapy. So that's the first thing. Know your limits and know what you actually looking for out your career. So for me, it was not being in therapy 40 hours a week. Maybe like five hours a week could be okay. But 40 hours, that's like the only thing I'm doing. That just didn't, it wasn't feeding my soul. Um, in addition to that, you know, when you are seeing clients, it's important to check in with yourself a lot. And mm -hmm. one thing about our field, we do a lot of supervision. So Pretty much anytime you're in a graduate program, you're going to be supervised by, you know, a therapist or a licensed psychologist. And that supervision time is important because that's the time where you can express that, like, yeah, I'm feeling overwhelmed or, oh, this client, what they're saying is bothering me. And you spoke on something very, very common, which is what we call in the field vicarious trauma. So it's trauma that we're acquiring just by hearing these traumatic things from other people. And for me, again, that was another thing that had me not wanting to be a therapist anymore because it is a lot when you constantly sitting there listening to people's, you know, depression stories or experiences, anxiety experiences or whatever it may be. Um, so it's so important to check in with yourself, check in with your supervisor if things is are getting hard for you at a certain time. Like I know one of my supervisees this year, um, cause like at my school, uh, the advanced students will try, will supervise the first years. So one of my supervisees pretty much just was going through a lot around a time that their friend had, um, attempted suicide like a few years before. And so it was something that bothered her like every you know, year around a certain time. So I was glad that she told me that because that signal, okay, I need to do some more check-ins with you around this time, or we need to make sure we're not just focusing on supervision based on your school experiences, but making sure you are okay as a clinician as well. So definitely seek out supervision. Make sure you know your, know your limits on what you are willing to do in a profession. And I would say um, another thing, 
just engage in self-care as much as possible. So if you are someone who knows, okay, after I have a client meeting, 45 minutes with them, I'm going to need an hour before scheduling another client. Then you need to set your schedule up like that. You just make, make you need to make sure that it's conducive to what you need to be able to keep going. Um, if you know, okay, after a stressful client, the client is more severe on their with their depression. Okay, maybe you need to go for a walk after that client so you can kind of shake off all those feelings and emotions just lingering in your office, you know? It's different things like that that allow you to start to get into a regimen that's going to be beneficial for you so that you can help your clients. Because at the end of the day, if you're not okay, you can't help nobody else. So just doing self-care is so important. And practicing what we preach. As clinicians, we always talking about these tools that we preach and have them in your toolbox. Do your own deep breathing. Do your own mindfulness and meditation. Um, use the apps that you suggest in. So I like to practice what I preach as much as I can. I meditate. I go to sleep to rain sounds. Um, I try to get in as much rest as possible. I get my nails done. I get my hair done. Like that stuff makes me feel good. So I try to do it as much as possible. Thank you for that. I know that's going to help somebody when they listen to this yes. interview. That's going to help them out a lot. And speaking of what some of the habits that you do, what were some of the biggest mental health challenges you, you faced when starting your entrepreneurial journey? Whew, uh, so many. Not even just my entrepreneurial journey. like Because that honestly started... My first ever business was like in college. So I didn't have a few businesses before, like my actual businesses that I'm engaging in now. Um, in college, I was a party promoter. So I used to plan parties and charge. It was like this all girls group. It was like six or eight of us. And it was kind of like Pink House Productions. And we would have like events. That was like a business in college. And then I also had this like, it was like an alcoholic slushy business. I don't know if y'all ever seen it in like the mason jars with the different colors. That was my second business and that went crazy. The The hood was loving it. And then my third business in college was, uh, it was me and just two people. It was like me and my best friends and it was called burnt acrylics. And we would like go get hats from the, um, the thrift store hats and shirts and we would like distress them with you know the scissors and make it and bleach them and yeah they was going crazy too everybody was feeling them so yeah i have been an entrepreneur a while even before businesses that like i'm still continuing to do today um my business now is milana wellness and i'm a wellness coach and i help women who are black millennial moms to be able to reduce their stress, to be able to learn how to implement self-care better and to be able to balance all the things that come along with their motherhood journey. So being as though I was an entrepreneur since I was like 18, 17, not, probably not 17. Um, it was probably like my second year of college. So probably 18 years old. Um, mental health journey. Uh, challenges was always a part of it. So when I had undiagnosed ADHD, which I feel like kind of slowed me down on a lot of things until I, I understood that like, okay, you have ADHD. But I didn't even understand that until I went to get my master's and that's where you learn how to diagnose. Like in undergrad, they're not really teaching you how to diagnose because it's more general psychology and diagnosing is more like clinical psychopathology type things. So I didn't know I had ADHD, but I knew in a sense that I wasn't living up to my full potential. Like I'm very smart and I know if I really tried, I could have been getting all A's. I never got all A's until my PhD program, like, which is wild. But I have accommodations now. I never had accommodations into my PhD program. 
So I had undiagnosed ADHD and I didn't even realize that until my master's program. So that was a big challenge for me in college. Um, and I didn't know it until way later, but looking back, I could identify it now. So I would never get all A's. I would get B's just because I would be unengaged. I didn't have accommodations. I would be turning in stuff late. So that was already a mental health challenge, trying to balance everything with like the businesses that I was doing mixed in with school, mixed in with partying, mixed in with, you know, trying to have a social life. So that was the first challenge, like my ADHD, dealing with time management, organizational skills, handing stuff in on time. And, and like the mental health, we call that executive functioning skills. So like time management, organization, you know, whatever. That was a struggle for me. It still is a struggle, but I'm way better now. And I know what I need. But when you don't know what you need, it's just something you have to kind of struggle through on your own. So that was one thing, um, balancing everything. And then the next thing, too, was like, I feel like I'm way more emotionally intelligent now. But I went through a really, really, really bad patch in college centered around relationships. Like when you're young, you might not know how to deal with stuff properly. So you just internalize. Well, at least I internalized everything. Now I'm more expressive and I'm like, hey, I don't like that. or just walking away and I'm cool with that because I've grown. But I was so distraught after like these failed situationships or relationships in college. And it would really, really impact my mental health. And I remember like my senior year, it was just a struggle. Like I literally could not go to class. I could not. And like I, I got a, the worst grades ever my senior year in college. I didn't get no A's. I got like two B's and two C's or something. And that was supposed to be my easy year, my light year. I had took extra classes before the end to kind of get ready to only take them four classes and like excel. But yeah, that was a struggle. Um, like the social aspect of, of being in college and trying to balance businesses and relationships or situationships or whatever it may be and it was so bad to the point where like I remember my senior year in college like I got put on antidepressants like I literally could not get up out the bed some days I wouldn't eat I didn't care about my personal hygiene like people would see me and be like girl like what's going on with y'all here like it was very obvious that I was not okay and I didn't even realize how bad it was until I like got put on antidepressants. I'm like, damn, like I really feel depressed. Like that was the first time I feel like I, I was able to recognize that like I needed help my senior year in college. So I was probably like 21. Um, and when you're depressed, you're not thinking about your businesses for sure. You think about survival. Like, am I going to eat today? Am I going to shower today? Am I going to brush my hair today? So I feel like that was a big, a big thing too. Just like social life, being depressed about love or situations when I should have been focused on like getting to the money and finishing school and doing well in both those areas. Um. So yeah, I would say those, those was real big struggles. Now, um, like I said, I have a whole different business, Milano Wellness, and. I think the biggest struggle now mentally is like the fear of failure or the fear that like I'm not doing something right. So I don't want to do nothing wrong, which can cause me to feel stagnant because now I'm not doing nothing. So like just that sense of perfectionism, fear of failure, that's something that I'm starting to work through. Even that I'm still growing. I'm still learning. So like I recently just got this this accelerator business grant. And that was something that really motivated me to, like, get back on my business. So I'm, like, putting together my signature package, my courses, my ebook, my freebies. Like, I'm kind of getting everything all together now because with the grant that I want, it comes with, like, mentorship. 
they giving me five thousand dollars for my business. So I feel like it's also a little bit less anxiety provoking when you don't got to spend your own money to try to get something off the ground. You know, to having that extra support financially from them is it's a blessing, and I can get. They have up to four rounds, so you can get 5000 each round. So I'm like, just knowing that if I do good and do what I'm supposed to do and I use the money for what I'm supposed to use it for, I could get more money. Like, that's motivating for me. So I have to find different ways to motivate myself, whether it's applying for grants, applying for, you know, mentorship or whatever it may be, because that motivates me to feel like, okay, well, I'm not alone no more, or I can't. I can't let them down or I can't lose this grant. So that's been something that I've had to use to kind of get me rolling mentally to feel like, well, it don't have to be perfect. It just has to get done. And it ha you have to start somewhere. So, yeah. Yes, you hit on a lot of good points. And it seems as if you like to do multiple things and sometimes doing them all at once. And I know last week we discussed hustle culture and mm. with you having different interests, how can how have you been able to combat that hustle culture? Is it I'm doing this because I'm interested in this? I'm doing this because I feel pressure from society to do these things. What is that? What does that look like for you? Yeah, so I no longer am participating in hustle culture. I'm doing things on my own. And it really takes setting boundaries within yourself because sometimes you got to say no to stuff. Mm -hmm. um, because it, it will get to the point sometimes where you're just so stressed. You don't want to do nothing you, you signed up for or obligated yourself to do. And... It just, it just don't be worth it. Like, I take my health so seriously now, especially since, again, like I told y'all before, I have a kid. And my when I was pregnant, my health, my stress levels was way too high to where mm -hmm. it, like, ultimately landed me getting hospitalized until my child came. And that kind of was a wake-up call for me. Like, if you don't get your stress levels together, you are not going to be here as long as you want to be here for your kid. So that's the first thing, just getting my stress levels together, knowing that if I say yes to everything, it's, something is not going to be done to the best of my ability, you know? Um, and then also, when you have something that's more higher quality, you don't have to hustle as hard. Mm -hmm. So it's like, am I finna try to get some more tutoring clients, which is something that I enjoy and I've been doing for like the last 10 years. But that's like $25 an hour, $50 an hour, depending on whatever. And not to say that that's not important, but it's like, do I want to do that? Or do I want to get my packages together where I could sell a $1,300 package? And it's just as valuable, just as helpful. You know, it may take a little bit more work, but I'm doing less hustling to get the money on the on the back end you know so i just had to realize that you got to focus in on what's gonna bring you the most happiness the most money the most success so that you can get that money happiness success and pour it into other passions if you want to be a serial entrepreneur so like i know it's a bunch of stuff or businesses that i want to try or do but I know if I try to do them all right now, it's not going to be successful. And they, like, probably don't have nothing to do with each other. Like, you could do them at the same time. But my attention is not going to be, you know, in the right place for all of them to be successful. Like, just as an example, I love getting my hair done. I love different colors, lengths, textures, whatever. Like, I just love, like, hair, weave, extensions, whatever. Mm -hmm. And I want to eventually have my own hairline. But that's something that's like, I know that it can happen anytime. So I'd rather do it in like six years, five years. When I'm done with school, my Milana wellness business is thriving. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I'm out of school. So that's one less factor I got to worry about. It's just like, why stress myself out trying to do that and get that off the ground and Milana wellness 
when I know that's going to be something that's not going nowhere. Like the hair care industry is not going nowhere. So I'm actually doing myself a disservice because I'm going to be trying to learn how to do both of these businesses at the same time. Mm -hmm. Whereas if I learn how to do Milano Wellness and I do that really well, that's going to teach me so much that's going to make it easier for a hairline because I'm going to learn how to get grants. I'm going to learn, like, I'm going to already have those, like, partnerships fostered. It's going to be way easier to know what to do and what not to do. So where that's going to pop way easier than this. Um, so it's like, why hustle when you can take your time and scale up the right way, do things to where it's not going to be so stressful on you? It just, for me, it don't make sense to hustle when I could just thrive in a way that's more nurturing to my body and my mind. Yes, I love that. And let's talk about perfectionism and then depression because you did mention those things yes. in the last question that I asked you. And for people who may not notice the signs because you said that Sometimes she wasn't able to make decisions because of perfectionism. How do you decipher between perfectionism and then maybe decision fatigue? Maybe I'm I'm don't suffer from perfectionism. Maybe I'm just tired because I have to make all these decisions. Maybe I'm a first time college student. I don't have anybody to call. I don't have a parent to call to point me into the right direction. And I'm having to make all these decisions at one time and I just, I'm tired. <laughs> how do mm -hmm. I, def, you know, make the difference between those? And how do I, you know, when I'm talking to a professional, not get misdiagnosed because some of these symptoms may mirror another um, situation and it's not true. That is a great question. So I'm gonna answer the first one first. So decision fatigue, you know, that's some, that's pretty much just being tired and overwhelmed and burnt out from making so many decisions, mm -hmm. which is a real thing. And especially for people with ADHD, I can tell you that's something that can definitely be impactful to you and your business. But with decision fatigue, I feel like it's more of a, I don't want to say surface level, but kind of just like you make it so much decisions, you just tired of it. Whereas perfectionism is like, it may not even be making a lot of decisions. You're simply trying to, um, let's say you're trying to just come up with a logo or something and you got three great logos. Like you already have done the back work. You are like, still like no none of these are good enough because you feel like it's always going to be something better out there mm -hmm. but the thing is you have to start somewhere so you need to make sure you like okay well which is the the great the lesser of the greater of three evils the lesser of three evils which one is going to be the best logo for me and it's more it's more deep rooted i feel like with perfectionism and more of an internal issue Whereas decision fatigue is more of an external, like you just burnt out because you had to decide what you're going to cook, what you're going to wear, um, which what's your major going to be. Like you just constantly making it could be even surface level decisions. I feel like with perfectionism, it's more like internal, deep rooted, long term issues. Um where you might need to think about like why is this never enough or like why am I scared to make this decision or to fail? Um, it just goes beyond decision making and to like belief in yourself, belief in your business, learning how to um learning how to have compassion on yourself and know that like things are always working in your good no matter how much you might feel like you're not living up to your abilities you know mm -hmm. um so yeah i would say those is like the biggest differences and they can happen at the same time you could be tired of mm -hmm. making a lot of decisions and have deep rooted like issues where you feel that 
you have a fear of failure or you are not able to get this get to this perfect standard. So they can coexist for sure. And as far as you asking about how do you make sure you don't get misdiagnosed, honestly, there's no is I can't even give you a, a good answer for that because it's absolutely possible because at the end of the day, people need to understand that mental health professionals are humans. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, a good psychologist or mental health professional, though, when you get your report, so, okay, in the mental health field, a report is like the same thing as a prescription a doctor writes you. It's like how you get access to accommodations, a IEP, like services that you may need like based on your mental health. It might be how you get access to like a disability check or whatever. Mm -hmm. But your that report that your psychologist psychologist writes up when you get diagnosed with something is essentially a script. Mm -hmm. So with that, um a good psychologist is going to have a section where they ruled out other things that were similar. So in, psychi in psychology, we call that a differential diagnosis. Mm -hmm. So if somebody like, oh, I think I'm depressed or whatever, but it could also be anxiety, they have some overlapping symptoms, or it could be ADHD too. A good psychologist is going to go through each one of those perspective diagnoses. And for the ones that it's not, they're going to say exactly why it's not. Because you have to rule out different criteria in order for you to get to the official diagnosis. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, honestly, it's no way to not be misdiagnosed because that it might really look like one thing, but a good from a mental health pro professional standpoint, if you are unsure always consult with a peer, like always consult with your supervisor or a mentor or a peer, because that's how we cover our butts to make sure we are providing the best care, it, especially if we think it's something else. So if you got two other colleagues that work in your office and you're like, hey, I got a client who presents with this, this, and this, I'm thinking it's this, what do you think? they're going to be able to be like, oh, yeah, I think it's that too, or mm, it might be this. And then y'all can talk about it and consult with them and try to get what is, what are we ruling out? Which symptoms are more fitting for this or that? So, yeah, is is there's no way, honestly, <laughs> to not get mixed diagnosed. But you can do your due diligence by um we have this book called the DSM-5, which is like the Bible of mental health diagnosis. So if you are curious about a diagnosis, the, the same exact criteria your mental health professional is going to use to diagnose you, you can go look at it and say like, oh yeah, this fit me or this one fit me more. And that could be your basis for when you go talk to them during the initial consultation about oh yeah i think i have anxiety like okay mm -hmm. well why do you think you have anxiety it's gonna be like um always feels on edge and you can say well i feel on edge a lot when i'm in class i'm always looking around and nervous boom you are essentially giving examples of why they that might be your diagnosis so if you are feeling like, hmm, it could be two things, the doctor might feel that way too, but they just have more insight on why it's not one of those things. So look at the DSM and, you know, be be a active participant in your own mental health journey. Sometimes you do got to do a little research because sometimes you don't know what's going on. You just feel how you feel. Look up your symptoms like, um, haven't slept more than three hours in two weeks. What's going on? Like, just start with something, and that can give you an idea of what to go in there asking questions about. You just dropped so many gems. I hope y'all listen to this, okay? Yes. yes, because there are some outside factors that could contribute to why you're feeling the way you're feeling. Mm -hmm. For instance, 
I'm not a healthcare professional, but if you are constantly drinking coffee and you feel feeling jittery, it could be the caffeine. You might need to, you know, scale that back a little bit. If you have health issues and you start developing things that you didn't have before, you look at the side effects of the medication that you're taking. What are those side effects? And then if the medication isn't for you, what are some alternatives? Speak with your doctor about that. And then what if you may not feel comfortable taking certain medications? What are vitamins? What are foods that you can eat that can help mm-hmm. combat those things? Because we have things like magnesium supplements you can take. You can take ashwagandha. You can mm-hmm. drink teas like chamomile tea. Um, before you go to bed at night to help reduce those stress levels and to help you go to sleep. There are many things that you can do to help combat those things while you are seeking that professional help as well. That doesn't necessarily require Western medication. There are herbs out there that you can take over-the-counter supplements and again, the foods that you eat and making sure you drink enough water and things of that nature. And that yeah. leads me to the question that I have for you is, what advice would you give to an entrepreneur who is hesitant about starting therapy or counseling because of the labeling, because mm-hmm. of being scared to be put on medication, because they don't want to seek accommodations from maybe their job or their school because of how they might be viewed from their peers? Yeah, that's a great question. So the first thing I would say is understand what you are looking for from your healthcare mm-hmm. provider because different people interact with mental health, especially in different ways and for different reasons. So, for example, it's essentially three people that may be dealing with your mental health. Mm -hmm. A psychologist, no, I will say four people. A psychologist, a psychiatrist, a therapist, and then a primary care person. So, first of all, it is a little problematic, and there's no shade to the doctors out there. It is a little problematic, though, for a primary care provider to be prescribing mental health medication. Mm -hmm. It's a little problematic. Now, not saying they are not necessarily, you know, knowledgeable about some things, but you really should go to a mental health provider for more mental health challenges. So, like, even with me, when I went to, I told y'all about my senior year, I got on antidepressants. A primary care person prescribed that for me. And I got the medications 10 minutes after meeting the person. So like that was really pushing that, but they didn't really, I don't feel like you can understand somebody issue in 10 minutes. So like it is an agenda being, being pushed to medicate people, but you have to understand what are you, like, what are you looking for? A, a primary care physician is a doctor. So they're going to treat you from a medical standpoint. They're going to give you medicine. Um, A psychiatrist is also a doctor. However, they are trained in mental health challenges. So they're going to be a little bit more knowledgeable about which medications might be better. Um, And again, they're not going to do a lot of talking. You are going to talk to them for maybe 30 minutes and you're going to get a prescription. That's what a psychiatrist is for, medicating mental health issues. So if you are like one of those people that, whether it's a stigma or you just don't want to be medicated or whatever, don't go to a psychiatrist or a PCP about your medical issues because they're going to give you medicine. Like they're medical doctors. That's what they do. Now, a psychologist is not able to prescribe medicine in most cases, most cases, I hopefully will be one of the people who can prescribe medication. It's very rare though, that you will see a psychologist prescribing medication because only some states have where they allow that. So 
a psychologist is going to be doing a bunch of assessments to try to understand how your brain is essentially um, functioning with the mental health issue. They are not going to give you medicine. What they are going to do is give you a treatment plan. So a lot of times that may be therapy or different behavioral things you can start to do. Um, you know, whatever it's going to align with your goals. So let's say one of your goals is like, oh, like I want to communicate better. Maybe she, he or she might tell you, okay, it could be good to practice and model conversations with a friend or a family member for 30 minutes every week or something. You know, like they're going to give you tangible things to do to help your mental health and to help you get to the goals that you are looking for. They also can give you an official diagnosis that you can take and get access to services. So that's accommodations, mm -hmm. disability checks, um, whatever, an IEP at a younger, at, for K through 12. Mm -hmm. That's what they're for. They're there literally just to almost, you know, do some data, collect some data, and then give you a, a diagnosis based on what they observed. Now, the last one is a therapist. A therapist cannot diagnose you. A therapist cannot provide you with any type of medication. They are literally just there to talk to you so that you have a, a sounding board or some emotional support as you work through your issues or your challenges. Everybody has their own little role. And sometimes I think it could just be a good start for people to understand what are they looking for. If you're really against medicine, maybe you need to just go to therapy. If you are open to medication, but you also would be willing to try other things, maybe you need to start with a psychologist and then specifically for the medication, get referred to a psychiatrist. So you need to do things like that and understand what are you willing to do and what do you, some people don't want to do therapy. they like, I'd rather just do some more holistic interventions. You can tell your psychologist that and they can provide other treatments or interventions for you on your treatment plan. So I would say start there. But as far as the stigma goes, it's really important to understand why does this stigma exist? So kind of doing some reflective thinking and just based on your different cultural identities and backgrounds, it can make sense. All right, if you're somebody in the Black community, it makes sense that you have distrust around medical or mental health support when this country has done things for hundreds of years to negate our mental health or to show that there's distrust in the medical community. So it might take you some, some reflection to even get to the point where you like, okay, I'm at a point where I'm open to trying it. And you have to almost take a risk, you know, where mm -hmm. you might just want, you might only trust a black clinician. That's fine. Find you a black clinician and like, almost kind of like date around when it comes to your, your mental health care and providers. It might not be the first one, the second one, the third one that works out, but maybe that fourth one will. So don't be afraid to, to step out and figure out who is going to be the best for you. Because at the end of the day, you're paying them. It's through your insurance or you're out of pocket. And it's for your own help. Like it's not for nobody else. But you, so if you're not vibing with somebody and you like to the point where you're like, oh, I don't think I'm going to go to therapy no more. I don't like my therapist. Try a new one, you know? You never know who's going to be the one for you until you try. And that's going to reduce that stigma because you're going to feel more comfortable to let your guard down. And typically, just based on the research, people who have clinicians that are like matching their identities and it's not just race but it could be lgbtq it could be being a woman whatever the more your clinician matches your identities the more likely you are to stay in therapy um or treatment and also to be able to um like benefit more from it so yeah i would say just do your research understand what you're looking for what type of provider you're looking for understand the identities that you hold and why they may be distrustful or have that stigma against getting mm -hmm. support and just date around try to see who's gonna be best for you yes i love that you 
aren't biased in your profession because some mm -hmm. some prof professionals you know they may tell you well this is the only way there's no alternative and things of that nature and i love that you are open-minded and was able to give you know our audience alternatives to what it is that the client may want you know they may want yeah. something different and i think that's very important in any profession to be open-minded and not just to be like this is this is the only the right way to do it. This is the only way you have to do it, and to be cognitive that there are different ways to doing things, and then that everyone should be open minded. It, we are diverse for a reason. The profession yeah. is diverse, and I love how you broke down the different, uh, you know, titles within the profession. Mm -hmm. It's like going to a specialist. Or right. Am I going to a counselor just that's just the primary, or do I need a specialist that can prescribe me the medication that I need, or you know, do I need to go to someone else? And I and I love that you spoke about all those things, and to the point where it's like, dang, you have so much knowledge that we could just talk for hours and hours, but yeah. we have to be <laughs> mindful of your time, and yeah. if people if you see this video and you have questions that we didn't ask, ask today and that she didn't provide the answers for always dm us comment the, your questions that you may have and we can do another video to answer your questions and then if there's something that keisha can't answer we can reach out to somebody who can answer those questions for you so you can get the necessary help and the necessary resources that you need. Keisha, before we wrap up, is there anything else that you would like to just share with the audience? Girl, I don't know if you hear it right, but uh, <laughs> he like, yeah, y'all need to wrap this up. But yes. no, I feel like you asked some great questions. I feel like it's very important. I appreciate it. The the culturally relevant questions because a lot of entrepreneurs that are maybe needing support could be from communities that don't typically go to seek treatment. So mm -hmm. I appreciated that. And I had fun answering the questions. Yes. And I just want to say, keep doing the, the amazing work that you do. Keep showing up as your authentic self because She's going to keep it real with you. <laughs> She's not going to sugarcoat it. <laughs> and that's why her audience love her. That's why she's probably going to be one of the top professionals in her field, getting the clients, relating to them Ooh. on their levels. Big Absolutely. And she mentioned that she is a wellness coach. If you want to reach out to her to seek that guidance and get that help from her, just DM her or ask her for her contact information i'm pretty sure she wouldn't mind helping you in that way okay all right you guys yes. at keisha milana on everything and i am specifically a wellness coach for black millennial moms so if you're not a black millennial mom i can refer you out but i am being very selective that was another just very quick that was another thing i had to make mm -hmm. sure i did in my business for it to start growing and not be so all over the place. Mm -hmm. Niche down. Don't be afraid to niche down and just help who you want to help. So yeah. Hit me yes. up. I need some coaching. Y'all mommy, black millennial. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, Keisha, for being vulnerable, being your authentic self, as answering those questions that some people may have wondered about. And again, we would love to have you back to answer more questions and to give your expertise in this field okay all right you guys until Bye. next time Thank i'm gonna let you should do our closing because i feel like i've been talking the whole time <laughs> Keisha, okay do our closing thank for you us. for having me <laughs> make sure y'all go follow both of us and follow the 21 minutes or less pages it's facebook and instagram at 21 minutes or less and then on YouTube, you can type in 21 Minutes or Less Podcast. And we'll see y'all next time. Bye. Bye.